Hello and welcome to the webinar titled Overview of Composite Manufacturing for Industry. Before we get started with the formal presentations, let me cover a few housekeeping items. First, Google Chrome is the preferred browser. Second, if you have questions regarding webinar functionality, enter into the chat box. Note that your microphones are automatically muted. If you have questions, comments, and or insights for our panel, please use the Q&A feature located on the right side panel of your screen. We'll be monitoring this feature and we'll address your questions and comments at the end of the formal presentations. Finally, we will be recording this presentation and it will be available on demand on the Composites community webpage. And now I would like to introduce our moderator, Edie Buchanan. Edie Buchanan is a sales strategist at Risk Heat in Columbus, Ohio. In this position, she works with the sales and marketing groups to provide technical content, including product application notes. Buchanan has published five articles in professional magazines in the past two and a half years, and is also part of Risk Heat's new product development team. Edie is currently serving her third term as an SME International Director and is active in the Composite Technology Community Advisory Team. Edie has been the board liaison to the SME's Constitution and Bylaws Committee twice, Member Council twice, the Certification, Oversight and Review Committee, and International Awards and Recognition Committee. She received a 2013 STEP Award from the Manufacturing Institute, the SME President's Award in 2003, and Regional Awards of Merit in 2000 and 2002 for her outstanding service. Outside of SME, she serves as both a mentor and referee for the first Lego League. Please join me in welcoming Edie. Thank you, Susie. Uh, we have several groups joining us for this presentation tonight. First and foremost, thank you to our speakers that come from the Composite Manufacturing Advisory Team of the SME Technical Communities. This group is composed of professionals working within the composite industry. Among their goals is to share knowledge with other practitioners, serve as mentors for emerging professionals, provide educational content and recognition for leaders in the industry. The Columbus Technical Society is an affiliation of member organizations, including SME, that meet to provide exposure to diverse technology topics and extend networking opportunities. I would also like to welcome SME members from across the country that are taking advantage of this virtual learning opportunity. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Lou Dorworth has been involved with the advanced composite industry since 1978. He has been associated with Avaris since its inception in 1983 and has been employed by Avaris Training Resources Incorporated since 1989, where he currently manages the Direct Services Division. Lou is a Composite Materials and Process Specialist by trade, with experience in research and development, material and processing engineering, manufacturing engineering, tool design engineering, tool fabrication, and of course, teaching composite-related subjects. Lou has been a professional member of the Society for the Advancement of Materials and Process Engineering, which is SAMPI, since 1982. He's also a senior member of SME since 1997 and is a well-published author, conference presenter, and co-author of the popular textbook titled Essentials of Advanced Composite Fabrication Repair, both the first and the second editions, which is published by Aviation Supplies and Pat Academics Incorporated. So thank you very, Lou. Thank you very much, Lou, for being with us. <laughs> Thank you, Edie. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, compo how, what composite is um, and some of the, uh, show you some pictures of some of the things that are made out of composite materials and just briefly touch on some of the fabrication or, or fabrication methodologies 
that we use in the business for making parts. Um, it's far more broad than I can do in a 15 minute segment, but I think it'll give you a good idea of what, uh, what, we're, uh, what we're building with composite materials these days, and we'll talk about why. So next. So composites are, in general, are made up of two or more materials. Okay, if you think about concrete, you could think that, okay, we've got, we've got cement, we've got aggregate, we've got sand. Technically, that makes it a stronger material. And since you, the constituents add up to a, more, a stronger material, uh, that concrete is a composite material. However, it's heavy. So when looking for lighter composite materials to do the job, uh, we look for lightweight type fibers and, and uh, matrix materials such as resin, uh, some are metal, some are uh, ceramic, but uh, we combine these two materials or more. Nowadays, uh, combining nanoparticles into the matrix material is very helpful um, to getting higher properties. So um, basically the fibers, they carry the majority of the load as illustrated by the green dots here on the screen. And the matrix material, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about plastics in this conversation, but the matrix material holds the, the fibers together and, and keeps shape and is the material that uh, uh, designates what the thermal capabilities are of anything made out of the composite. All the fibers have high thermal capability, almost. Next. So uh, here's a slide that uh, we talk about, well, why do we like composites? Um, we make, can make the lightweight structures with very high strength to weight ratios um, using carbon fiber, aramid, glass fiber, and other fibers. There's a whole long list of fibers that we could talk about, but these are the main players. Carbon being the stiffest material out of the bunch and glass being the most flexible. So we have that high stiffness to weight ratio with carbon fiber. Um, and that, that is what most of the uh, high-end aircraft structures are made out of and other structures, space structures, et cetera, because of the high stiffness to weight. Um, we can achieve higher temperatures than polymer matrix materials or plastics by going to ceramic matrix composites or uh, even metal matrix composite. Um, the good thing about ceramic is it has a low coefficient of thermal expansion and it, it makes it ideal for high heat areas uh, such as inside of a, uh, in a uh, jet engine, okay, next. So here is a comparison. Uh, this graph gives you a quick idea of the area of, um, of, of where polymer matrix composites fall. So within the pink boundary, you can see that uh, the weight is comparable to some filled plastics with, with the composite. And uh, the density, as far as the density goes, but the strength is much higher. When compared to metals, there's no question how much lower the density is for the composites compared to, say, aluminum there in the purple and uh, titanium and steel out on the far right, okay? So the strength to weight is right in that sweet zone. Uh, where we can get uh, densities as low uh, or lower than aluminum, okay? So how much higher strength value? Next. When it comes to stiffness to weight, you can see where the composites fall. Now, in general, the yellow uh, oval that you see there designates uh, polymer composites, meaning the plastics are the matrix material. Ceramics, metal matrix would fall further out to the right, okay, where it's a little bit heavier. Again, the densities on uh, the bottom axis and the uh, stiffness as calculated with Young's modulus uh, is the going up the left side. So you can see that we get up there comparable to even high-end metals as far as stiffness at a much lower weight. Anything below the weight of that composite is really in the category of wood, balsa wood, foams, uh, products like that. 
Um, and uh, of course, uh, we're looking for the stiffness with uh, a carbon fiber and uh, aramid fiber and, and those such fibers. Next. Another reason we like composites, and this is really key, um, a lot of projects that are going on right now uh, to replace infrastructure that has been in place for many, many years include composites for a couple of different reasons. One of the main reasons that they're, they're looking at composites is because they don't corrode. So you're not out there constantly chasing rust and repainting structures to maintain them. Um, in the case of air, aircraft or cars or anything else, that same fact um, exists. So no corrosion of the composite is, is a biggie. Um, it also, composites don't fatigue like metals. Um, over time, you may see some inherent fatigue, but since the uh, composite uh, performs in a, an inher inherent elastic method uh, versus the plastic behavior of metal, uh, we don't see that, uh, you know, when we bend it back and forth under the yield, we don't normally see any cracking. <clears throat> so, with composites, we get a longer, a longer predictable life cycle, and we don't have to worry about cracks in the classic sense uh, as you do with metals. Now, there are other things to worry about, like inner laminar um, uh, delaminations, disbonds, things like that, but that's a whole different category um, because uh, basically everything is a laminated structure using these fibers and the resin to, um, to build them up. Uh, fewer parts are required to make large structures, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Next. Uh, composite sporting goods, you, you probably are familiar with some kind of a, a carbon fiber fishing pole or other product that, uh, um, that you use in your daily life. Uh, they make bicycles, tennis rackets, uh, you know, uh, um, you can buy snowboards, uh, just about anything that, that you can think of. They, they will build it out of a composite. Um, many, many years ago, we did some work with uh, a couple of high-end tennis racket manufacturers who support all of the pros. And there's a lot of engineering that go, goes into that type of uh, racket. But the only way they can get the performance that they do is with the composite frame. So that is that is a big plus, and that's true with composites in general. Is that if we're going to use a composite, it's because we want to have the performance from that composite. Next, medical equipment. You know, uh, GFRP stands for glass fiber reinforced plastic. CFRP stands for uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic. On the left is a glass CT uh, table. They also have a carbon fiber version of that table, and it's transparent to the uh, to the X-ray. So when you go through the CT scan back and forth, it doesn't show up on the CT scan, um, and that, that that way they don't have to weed out a background. Okay, um, prosthesis wheelchairs. You've probably seen uh, some of these things made out of carbon fiber co composites. Um, what's more interesting is now that they have uh, not only surgical instruments, but also implants uh, that are made out of composites um, so that uh, you don't have the classic uh, resistance to metal. Most of these are very inert, but uh, some people with metal implants um, run into problems over time that can be alleviated by going to a uh, carbon fiber or a composite. Uh, implant. They're stiffer and lighter as well. Okay, next. Storage tanks and vessels. You you probably pass by um, when you're driving through the country. Uh, you probably pass by numerous tanks and vessels um, that you would see on the side of the road. We have right outside my window here, we actually have uh, light poles that are all composite and they're made in a similar fashion to these, which I'll show you next. Next. Underground storage tanks. Um, so for fuels, um, for uh, chemicals, uh, for all of those things that we tend to store underground, 
uh, you'll find these tanks. These are made out of a glass final extra mixture, and the glass is a special material to uh, contain chemical. Okay, next. The method that is used to make these tanks is a filament winding process. And the filament winding process takes fibers from the left side, they combine them into, um, into spools or widths of the, um, of the fibers as they go into a resin bath. And as they come down, they're a width uh, of material. So there's a bunch of little fibers side by side you know, anywhere from two inches wide to, you know, to a single toe, uh, meaning one one yarn high, uh, thick, or as many as a, you know, a 12 inch segment can be laid down. Most of the filament winding is done with single toe up to about two inch. After we get past that, we start to see that we go to a, a more automated type of process, which I'll show you here later. But that's what filament winding is. Those tanks I showed you are all done using this process. Next. Transportation. This is, this is one application that uh, uh, on the right there, the high-speed rail, the H, uh, HS2, it's over in the UK. So Britain has taken it upon themselves not only to build this uh, high-speed high train, uh, with mostly composites, okay? But they've also uh, built all of the infrastructure for it or are building it currently, um, including overhead line gantries, composite noise barriers, uh, architectural roofing, station fittings, bridges, rails, all kinds of, not the rails that it's running on, but uh, guardrails, things like that at the uh, stations, platforms for the decks, all of these different things are being made out of composites for all of the reasons we talked about earlier. Uh, at Walmart there on the left had invested in a concept truck that they built where the uh, actual truck itself, if you will, is a, it's made out of, all the fairings are made out of composites, but the truck is a hybrid. So it runs on both on diesel fuel and electric power. The uh, trailer is a carbon fiber trailer um, that weighs about 4,000 pounds. So it's, it's considerably less weight than, say, a steel trailer, which comes in around 10. Okay, so that's what we're looking at, the trade-offs there with composites. And, um, you know, more and more so, we, we're seeing more transportation uh, being, uh, more things being built with uh, composites in transportation and all of the facilities. Next, marine. The marine area, um, most of the manufacturers in marine have been using fiberglass with uh, polyester or vinyl ester resins for quite some time. I mean, we can track that back to the 50s. Um, so marine, it's not a new thing in marine. What is new in marine is that we have, um, we have the ability to make very high performance uh, structures rather than just the classic uh, E-Ray Sundancer type boat, which is all fiberglass, chop mat type thing. We can take long fiber reinforcements, carbon fiber reinforcements, and build very highly efficient yachts, um, you know, uh, low observable uh, type uh, battleships, America Cup racers, um, and in particular, this is quite impressive. There are the M5, the, uh, the boat known as the M5, it's uh, formerly the Mirabella 5. That boat has a uh, carbon fiber mast that is 292 feet high. And so in order to keep the, the weight down, the carbon fiber is highly desired. It also doesn't have the flex that you would have with a, uh, aluminum or other metal post. So it is quite the thing. Um, and they have a method of grounding it. So if lightning strikes the top of that mask, it goes all the way down and dissipates uh, in the keel. Um, so that, that keel is dragging in the water there. Next. Wind energy. We do a lot of business with wind energy. 
um, including, uh, you know, making uh, blade repairs and things like that. Um, but the turbines are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. As you can see here, th these turbines that you see in this picture are primarily glass fiber shells over a carbon fiber spar. So the spar itself is a carbon fiber material so that it, it can, um, it, it's stiff enough to take the loads, okay, that are necessary. The glass is the, are the outer skins. Uh, they're made with a, 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 a core construction type uh, methodology. Um, and those are mostly thermoset type resins in that construction. However, they're going to a thermoplastic as well. So it may be easier to make. Um, as they get bigger, you're more likely to see carbon fiber in the actual blade skins as well as the, is the spars so that you have more efficiency in the blade um, and you have the right angle of attack at the right, right wind loads as they get bigger. The illustration on the right there shows, you know, the spruce goose at the top and a 747 at the bottom. So you can compare the length of those blades to the wingspans of those aircraft and uh, get a, kind of get an idea of what we're talking about here as far as the size. Now, 100 meters is old hat. They're already making 140 meter offshore wind blades. So they're just getting bigger and more complex and they can only do it with composites. They could not do this with metals. Next. Here's a, a wind blade. You can see how long the mold is there. You can kind of get an idea. I believe that's a 90 meter blade that they're making there. So that blade is made with a process called resin infusion, which um, you put in the dry materials into a mold, okay, and you vacuum bag over it with a vacuum bag with all of this different plumbing that is going to move resin into the pack. It's kind of like an injection mold, but with, with a loose membrane on one side, okay? And so the resin there and the little pink uh, in the bucket moves into the, uh, into the, uh, the mold, if you see, on the, on the side of the, uh, uh, fibers that are under a vacuum bag and vacuum is pulled on that vacuum bag and the only thing moving that is atmospheric pressure um, that's the only pressure needed under vacuum to move that resin into that area and then you cure it in place next um, we you know military have been using composites for many many years you, you go back to the 60s, they were they were using boron uh, epoxy for making uh, for making control surfaces, you know, rudders on the F-14s, things like that. Over time, we have come to the point now that we're making entire structures. Um, so the the aircraft you see here are all intensive uh, composites. So you know, more than uh, more than 50%, most of these are more than 80% composite uh, that you see there, and uh, mostly carbon fiber as well. Next. Uh, the um, UAS or UAV world, uh, unmanned systems world, uh, they rely heavily on composite materials in order to have both stealth characteristics and to have, um, have the lightweight uh, necessity for flight with smaller motors, smaller engines, uh, for lower signature, that sort of thing. Um, so some of you may have seen some of these in magazines or such, but um, if you haven't already, you're going to see those quadrocopters in your neighborhood. <laughs> we have a neighbor that flies his regularly. Next. Boeing 787 on the left, Airbus A350. There are new aircraft in the pipeline uh, with comparable designs. Um, the both uh, aircraft have composite carbon fiber fuselage and wing structures and wing box structures. Also, all of the control surfaces and such uh, fall into that category. So commercial aircraft, we've been slowly, incrementally using composites uh, since uh, the 70s, and now we're at a point where we're making the entire structure. I think somebody, Robin, maybe you're you're unmuted there. Can you mute? 
there are a lot of background. Next, um, the 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 beauty of fiber re reinforced polymer structures or composites is the sense that we can mold just about any shape. So much like injection molding, if you think about it, we can mold just about any shape with the proper tooling. So as structures get bigger and more complex, we are we're, uh, currently, well, we have been since the 80s, integrating stiffeners into the, the wing skin structures, integrating uh, frames into the barrel section um, of, of aircraft fuselages. So the, these are very large scale structures. Um, most of it has to do with aircraft. Uh, but we also see it in other industries where we've molded all of this uh, structure in one piece or um, very few pieces. Okay, and that's that's kind of what we're trying to do. So the beauty of having a plastic and having fiber reinforced plastics is the ability to actually mold the shape, molding the stiffening. You don't have to uh, do as much assembly, so on and so forth. Next. One method of automating layup of a structure includes uh, automated tape layup. Uh, we call it ATL in the business. Here's, here's an example of a machine that can do, you know, down to a quarter inch wide lay down up to about a, a 12 and a half inch wide lay down of materials at one time. So automatic tape layup can can uh, occur rather rapidly on gentle shapes. If you want to step into um, a more complex shape, generally we go with a what is called a, a, a automated fiber replacement. Next, and you can see here what automated fiber replacement uh, looks like. Um, here you have a big um, gimbal, a machine that is robotic, that is moving around and uh, the fibers are all running off of spools. They're already impregnated with a resin. They're coming off the spools at the head. They're laying down in widths, you know, from anywhere from uh, a quarter inch to two inches um, normally, sometimes a little wider, um, down on the mold surface why they have to control it uh, in width, uh, unlike the tape, is so that we don't have gaps. Um, we want to minimize gaps. We want to be able to uh, place segments side by side on complex shapes. So we, we take the time to design what, what kind of laydown is going to occur using the machine. Most of these machines are adaptable um, to, you know, multiple structures. In fact, I saw somewhere uh, on Sampi's platform, I believe, they're having a, a, a video of this uh, technology. Uh, it's free, it's running on the 8th. If anybody needs, would like to see that, please let me know and I'll, I'll send out um, a link to it. Anyway, uh, this is automated fiber placement. Uh, it's heavily used in aerospace currently, and uh, it's a, a method for manufacturing large scale composites. Next. Smaller scale uh, aircraft as well. Um, Honda, Cessna, Diamond, you've probably heard these names, Cirrus, um, and Epic. Um, Brock is going to give us a little tag on that aircraft right there at the end of this show. So we'll wait for him. Um, they're all composite materials. Um, some have more carbon than others. Um, and the Joby Air Taxi is flying now, and it's uh, it's approved for use in, I believe, the UK. Next, here's here's something I've been watching since the very beginning of this project. This is the um, James Webb Telescope. Again, this is something that could only be made out of composite, and they're using uh, carbon fiber with a, a resin called cyanate ester resin which has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. And the back frame that you see there, the black uh, back plane support structure for this telescope 
uh, actually is made of that combination of carbon fiber, very high modulus, very stiff carbon fiber materials, along with that cyanate ester resin, so that it has very low uh, th uh, thermal expansion uh, in, in at temperature. Um, the sails you see underneath that also are constructed with composite framework. And all of this has to, you know, deploy way out in space. They're getting ready to launch this in a couple of weeks, and I wish them the best of success. But, uh, it, you know, much like the Hubble, you really couldn't do it without composites, be able to uh, uh, keep that, uh, you know, keep that uh, focal distance and, and low thermal expansion so that you can compensate with, with the uh, optics. Next. Um, this is the Alfa Romeo 4C. We have tubs like that in our facility that we use for repair training. Um, they're all monocoque made in, uh, in one big mold. Sometimes you'll see you know, little pieces that are molded separately and then bonded together, but that one is made all in one piece. Uh, next. It is made using a process called prepreg hand layup, where you're actually laying up the material against the mold and uh, processing it with a vacuum bag on the back side of the mold, so and then curing it either in an autoclave or an oven. Uh, so it's a, actually a labor-intensive methodology uh, using pre-impregnated uh, carbon fiber fabric materials in this case to manufacture that car. Okay. A lot of other um, automotive manufacturing methodologies um, are more automated. Next. The, for instance, here's a uh, chassis for the Lamborghini uh, Aventador. The Aventador is a beautiful car. It's all carbon fiber. Um, it's very well made. It's made with a combination of different materials, uh, all carbon, but different types of carbon where they have some uh, carbon fiber that is actually a, a short fiber molded uh, type stuff, material. Um, and then the big large chassis area that you see there is all molded using the resin infusion process, much like that you saw in the, uh, um, in the wind blade earlier. So they, they use a process like that. Obviously they're not, uh, they're not making hundreds of thousands of these per year. Um, they probably you could probably count on uh, all your hands and toes how many that got, actually go out the door every year. <laughs> but uh, um, you know their their factory is set up to do that kind of processing, and that's what they do. Uh, they also have some pro other types of processing, forged mat materials that I was talking about, and, and other ideas for other cars. Yes, next is fine. The BMW line, they use a different concept for most of their um, manufacturing. Instead of using the, uh, the infusion process like the previous uh, car, what they do is they use a uh, high pressure um, resin transfer molding process, which is very similar, except for it's a closed mold process. And what they do is they make separate parts. Uh, for example, in the right hand, uh, you can see the the what they call the life module, but basically that's the chassis. Um, that particular module, you can see how light it is, but the side uh, pillars um, are bonded to a main frame in that particular photo. So you can see, uh, you know, that they have, uh, you know, multiple pieces coming together when you look actually look at that uh, life module. So it's not molded all in one shot, but in three, and then bonded together. So BMW uh, has come a long ways with that particular methodology for building the i3s. They've also incorporated a similar technology in the i8. Uh, in the i7, however, they have selective composite carbon fiber reinforcements that are used with um, uh, very high strength steel in selected areas at the A frame, B frame, uh, C frame areas. Next. This is what resin transfer molding looks like, the closed molding process that I mentioned. 
where the dry fiber preform is closed in the mold, uh, resin is injected, and they push the air uh, ahead of the resin out of the mold, very much like uh, resin injection molding, but with fibers in place. Uh, next. Here's um, a low pressure resin transfer molding um, setup. In this case, the uh, the injection equipment is on the left. It's a mixing, metering, and dispensing cart where uh, the resin components are two part or three part. They are mixed together on demand. Uh, there's a nozzle that gets plugged into the tool there that's in the press. And on demand, the resin is supplied to fill the cavity. So, you know, the, the, you know, it, it saves on a lot of setup compared to other processes. It's more of a automated process, but you still need the guy to plug in the, uh, um, the, the, uh, dispenser, uh, to the, the mold itself to connect that with quick disconnects and disconnect it after the molding process. All of these processes involve some sort of heat. And when the mold is closed, the platens are heated uh, to a specified temperature for a short period of time in order to cure the resin. Um, most of the aerospace parts take hours to cure. Um, so they, they take much longer to do, They're, especially the hand-laid prepreg materials. And most of that's done in an autoclave rather than a press. So there's some differences there. And certainly there are uh, many, many offshoots of all of these methodologies that I just don't have time to show you today. But this gives you an idea of some of the methods and processes and the types of parts that we, we make using composite materials. Next. So to summarize the set of slides that I just showed you, um, composites are used in these lightweight applications because we have the high strength to weight ratio, the high stiffness to weight ratio, the no corrosion issues. Um, however, there are warnings that metal in the presence of carbon fiber, uh, they're, they're, you know, here and there, uh, one's anodic, one's cathodic, and uh, you get a lot of, uh, uh, pro, uh, you know, you get a lot of problem with the uh, metals in that particular sense. Um, they can co corrode. The, the composite will never corrode. Um, however, the metals can. So lots of stories on that that I won't go into, but at this point in time, we've learned to isolate any metals that we put in with a carbon fiber structure. Um, so we don't have the metal fatigue. We have other methods, uh, 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 other fatigue methods that we have to concern ourselves with. Um, they're not on the order of metal fatigue. So they're quite uh, drastically less as far as any concerns with fatigue. In fact, some, some structures I've worked with in the past actually improve through fatigue cycles. So it's interesting to see that. And we, we have the ability to mold very large structures using composites, entire aircraft fuselage, wing sections, automotive tubs, wind blades, uh, you know, almost all of those, uh, you know, uh, larger medical products. All of those things are, are pretty much done in one shot. So uh, we have that ability, much like plastic parts, we, we're just upscaling and including fibers. Um, so, you know, we share some of the same tooling ideas as, uh, as the automotive industry, but um, more so on a lower level of delivery. So, you know, for instance, the i3 only has like, 50,000 a year on their assembly line. Anyway, that's my part, and I'd like to turn it back over to Edie, and Edie is going to introduce Robin, and he's going to talk a little bit about machining these materials. All right, thank you very much, Lou. That was a lot of really good information. Uh, so our next presenter is Robin Zwick. Robin is a manufacturing engineering technical lead at the Boeing Company in Mesa, Arizona. He supports a wide variety of aerospace and space production programs at Boeing, such as the AH-64, the F-18, F-22, P-8, the 787, uh, CST-100, and the Phantom Works programs. 
Robin uses his design for productivity or producibility and Lean Plus design build skills in the integration product team, uh, design groups to improve conceptual designs, prototype development, flight testing and production. His areas of specialization are in composite design and fabrication, design for additive manufacturer tooling and precision machined assembly. Uh, Robin's been an SME member since 2018. So thank you very much. And I'll leave this with Robin now. Thank you very much, Edie, for this uh, nice introduction. And I agree, we've had some great uh, uh, information from Lou. And I'm going to be um, discussing this, uh, and some of them will overlap. I want to uh, just to kind of kind of get it to where we're going to be talking about the machining of composites. One way to do that is to compare it with another uh, conventional machining, and we'll start now. So I know we were going to hold our Q and A at the end, but I decided to ask a question out there: uh, Isn't machining carbon fiber composite the same as machining anything else? Is that right? Well, no, uh, it would not be a correct assumption. Uh, machining a cured carbon con fiber composite materials. Uh, these, uh, when this was initially introduced into the aerospace industry, uh, <clears throat> they actually designed as if this was aluminum part or what we call black aluminum. So when you held up the composite uh, assembly, and to the metal assembly, they looked almost the same, except for carbon pieces fastened together. That's not really taking a good advantage of uh, your materials. And we'll kind of go on and talk about that a little bit more. But to uh, do a comparison, I just used a, a IM7, the 7075 grade uh, aluminum alloy. And we'll compare those. They are both aerospace grade materials, and they are uh, also used for fabricating primary aircraft structures. And the intent of these slides is to provide a, an overview of the process and the related machinings to both materials and compare the differences and discuss them and field any questions when we're done here. So uh, <clears throat> start off with a baseline. Theoretical assumption that we are going with is that all the work up front has been done. Uh, all the design work, all the tooling work that would have been needed, uh, the CNC programming is done, and uh, the shop has a CNC like machine ready. Uh, so we're doing like a side by side comparison of these uh, uh, two types of materials. Next slide, please. And with that, that's where we hit a, uh, a difference and a big one as well. Um, the like machines that I was talking about uh, cannot be both used on, uh, use the, the same like machine for composite as you can for aluminum. Uh, it just is not going to work, and I'll explain why. Uh, you will probably need a dedicated machine for the com machining composites because of the following. Uh, it's, you'll get ma material contamination, and when you're uh, machining a aluminum part and you want to do a switch to a composite, there's a great chance that um, you're going to get some kind of contamination, either from the cutting fluid that was on the aluminum part, uh, oil and grease from the uh, machine itself will have a, a potential to get on your composite part, and you don't want that. Also, uh, <clears throat> composite parts need a take care of their uh, dust and particles that they're machining, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, machining carbon fiber, it does produce a fine fiber, uh, powder, that is harmful uh, to breathe in. And you'll need to wear a PPE and have adequate dust collection system available. 
And the call-outs in the work area and something that I would include in my planning if I were going to write work instructions for a machining composite part is that, that protective equipment needs to be worn, safety glasses and dust particulate masks are to be worn at all times when you're machining them. It does get pretty dusty and I'll show some of these uh, videos down uh, as we further get into this. And along with that uh, CFRP uh, machining, that fine powder, if it's allowed to build up it and uh, becomes airborne, uh, it can be a, an explosion or type of situation. Uh, that is why there's a lot of the uh, uh, machines that will have to have uh, explosion-proof connections when they're set up and grounded and means of collecting that uh, uh, composite dust uh, prior to uh, during the process because uh, it, it will uh, it's conductive and it's and it's fine powder and it's will can become combustible just like other materials like the aluminum uh, if you were going to make powder out of that and magnesium and, the, and so forth. So uh, <clears throat> it'll be collected and uh, and also a, a good point to make is not to be mixed with uh, uh, like a metallic material because that could ignite sparks as well. Next slide, please. Get something. Here's a, a general uh, uh, cross section of some of that PPE that's available and the vacuum. Systems, nothing going, but the one in the lower left-hand corner gives you an idea, and that happens to be graphite, but it's still kicking out a lot of dust. If that big vacuum uh, tubing was not around, it'd be everywhere, and you wouldn't like it. It's very abrasive. We'll talk about that. Uh, next slides. So, uh, really briefly, with the uh, machining of the aluminum alloys. Uh, that's the garden variety uh, aerospace alloy. Uh, a lot of things are known right off the bat. Uh, you get your material characteristics, grain structure, heat treatment is all known ahead of time. And you can even get the material as a certified for formity if you even had to for material traceability. And then in the machinery handbooks, uh, the feed rates are are there. They're optimized. You can find out what uh, the best feeds and speeds rates are for the specific particular materials that you are machining, and the cuts and so forth. That's all been historically decades uh, old and uh, available. Also, uh, the cutters, the uh, Fluted end mills, fluted uh, and uh, shell mills are uh, been around for a long time. And one thing that, I, that stood out to me is in the uh, machining process, when you start to make an aluminum part, it's almost right away. You start with your billet of material. Maybe you'll square it up and do some things like that. But right after that, it's going into the NC machine. Excuse me, I got allergies. Uh, and uh, the efficiency of these uh, shell mills can be visually, uh, you can, by watching the chips, tells a lot, both in steel and in, uh, in, in aluminum. And we'll go on to the next slide and show you. And here's on the left is the high-speed machining, and that's a very popular process in aerospace. You can go high speeds, feeds, and not be taking a lot of material, but you can go through and make shelves and, and other types of thin walled parts very easily. And over on the right is a, uh, <coughs> a record breaking uh, event that uh, was made by the Swiss machine builder. I can't pronounce that, so I won't. And you can see the uniformity of these chips that look like uh, at least a three-eighths cut, and it must have been really pulling off the material from that block. 
And that's that's the summary of uh, of the aluminum component uh, that to be machined. Next slide, please. Now on to the uh, machining carbon fiber. I think it's important to bring up uh, all the things that go into uh, machining uh, or uh, building the uh, composite part. And just as I had, uh, it, it just became really aware, been working around them, but it just jumped out at me is the machining process is done at the tail end of the composite build. Uh, the layup is up front, uh, and I put some things in red that are high dollar. You can see where the cost is growing a lot with the uh, N-bar type steel that is common for carbon fiber uh, prepregs, and you put it into an autoclave, and that is another big high dollar cost that you wouldn't have with a machine part. And you can read this uh, at your leisure. Uh, I don't want to get into it too much, uh, but they are cured at really prescribed temperatures, and the ramp up, uh, hold, and cool down rates are very uh, precise. And the takeaway on this is all that work up in the probably. Uh, the 80% of the, the slide, one at the bottom is where uh, machining and the control of the surfaces where your part starts to take shape. And notably, the, even the contour of the, uh, the uh, part is all uh, tool controlled, so you're not even machining that. What you're basically down to is machining the profile and any holes, any cutouts, and things like that are uh, are going to be machined. And that's the big difference. One starts at the beginning, the other one starts at the end, and the other one has a lot of complexity going into it to uh, before you machine it. And I think I made a note in there uh, that uh, some of these are, are uh, primary structures. Uh, bulkheads, uh, the uh, monocoque fuselage, as Lou had mentioned, rotor blades that I work with at uh, Boeing Mesa, all get machined close to the end of the process. So, no uh, worry, right? Uh, here is your $150,000 part. Uh, and you're going to machine a little bit on it. Be careful not to uh, go too far out of the tolerance range because if you do, it's going to be scrap. That would kind of be a little bit uh, worrisome uh, to me, but that's the way it is, and we take very precautions on uh, how we machine and how the composites gets built, particularly in rotor blades. Next slide, please. So here is a uh, the autoclave, and just to kind of give you an idea how big they are, I pulled the uh, another world record uh, holder. Uh, this particular autoclave is in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, South Carolina, made by the ASC company. And in the lower left slide, right in the middle, way in the back person standing, and up above is uh, standing at the front, and you can see the surrounding structure, that autoclave, and I don't want to even guess what the price tag would be to put that thing up. There's just a lot of, a lot of cost to recover on these composite parts, as, you can, as we'll see. And next slide, please. So this one is a, uh, a an example of a uh, tool and a part coming off the tool. It's an aluminum tool, but a carbon part. Now there's a coefficient of thermal expansion associated with aluminum and carbon, it's different. You have to 
plan to uh, make your aluminum part and allow for the expansion to meet your uh, end part size. So you're planning for the growth of during the cure cycle. And Lou, you can feel free to, if you want to weigh in on anything and add to this, you know you're the uh, expert among us, a lot of these things. So uh, no, that's there, there, there are just a huge difference in the CTEs. So you have to be careful with the molding with aluminum. But we, we can move on. I've already yeah. spent yeah, far Indeed. more time than I should have. And the uh, uh, NVAR would be your closest one to get the same CTEs. But you can see the complexity is really happening on here. So uh, the tooling, go, go ahead and move forward. That's fine. Uh, drills and end mills for CFRPs. This is going to be interesting. Uh, so again, be careful. And I'm dating myself, and I'm probably going back 30 years when they called uh, composites black aluminum. But I thought I'd share it with my other people that have been in the business a long time so we can at least relate to it. But the uh, don't use the same approach. And high-speed uh, items that you would use on aluminum, you would not want to use. Parts. It's very abrasive. High speed steel won't uh, take long to wear out. Machine and laminate. If you're doing a one off, potentially a solid carbide tool can be used, but it's got to be kept sharp. That means by either replacing it often or resharpening them and to keep them active. Sometimes people have tried. Uh, using cutters uh, that have a uh, uh, treatment to them, end mill type cutters and drills. They're chemical vapor deposition and what is a physical vapor deposition. And that's a coating applied, wear resistant coating applied to the uh, end mill. Titanium is another one. And they, unfortunately, with the edge rounding that occurs, some of the steep angled metal cutting end mills and drills will not will delaminate most composites and we don't want to do that make a scrap part right after we drill it that is your worst case scenario and that's what we're almost setting ourselves up for we gotta be exact and our accept no defects make no defects defects and pass no defects applies you have to be very careful, and a lot of this gets accomplished up front before you even get your designs done. You should be working on uh, <clears throat> the right tooling for this type, the types of uh, uh, composite uh, components you're going to be fabricating. Good choice, again, is a, a neutral or reverse helix cutting tool, like the router bit we're about to see. Uh, and it's good for machining plastic and nylon. Fortunately, there might be a specialty cutter you'll have to have made ground for composite work and for drilling hole, hole, hole or for drill hole bits, uh, a double angled point that reduces the force through the breakthrough as you can get uh, damage when you go into the composite fabric and damage when you go out, a double whammy. So that is a, a challenge on that. And, and you can see all the potentials for going south. And there's, there's, a reasons, there's a reasons why we do that, and I'll to those towards the end. Next slide, please. So the drills and end mills are right in front of you. So uh, take your pick. Uh, and if you were making, if I to make a decision uh, when you had your part made and try to figure out what to, you're going to use, that would be the wrong time to do it, and you would more than likely scrap out uh, parts. So making like coupons, like specimens, machining them, going through trials, and uh, I don't, I think I can say this for Boeing. Uh, what we do, just to make sure everything is working properly, every 100th 
blade is dedicated to destructive testing. We will pull the blade off the line and a good, nothing wrong with it, blade and start taking cuts and check to make sure all of our interior contours are right and everything else is being cured as planned. That's how important we feel those blades are to the user, the U.S. Army. And we want to give them zero defects. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, machining uh, video, and it's the uh, BMS Cora mill. And it either launched or I gave the uh, 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 it uh, could possibly be uh, a graphic. Can we finish that, or is that uh, did it stop in midstream uh, somewhere? There's a tail end to that, and if that's not, that's okay. But I, yeah, I think what we just what we just saw was was hype. And maybe on the end of that, they're doing it for real part. It's on a machine tool. But that's the uh, the things we look for, and I'd really love to see real part doing that in a spindle on a machine and hear them hear the uh, RPMs cranking and the material being uh, cut. But I have not yet to see that. So uh, talking about the pre-production opportunities and doing things up front, uh, that carbon fiber material is very abrasive and it's going to take different approaches drilling and milling to avoid the delamination of the holes and both at the entry and exit. Also uh, the methods for machining won't work so we don't even want to go there to begin with and when the benefit of this here's another opportunity that uh, should be taken advantage of is when that airframe becomes stronger and lighter the benefits are other systems like the propulsion systems get increased efficiency now you're pushing something lighter that you didn't have to push before with the same amount of horsepower you're going to be going faster or thrust and that's the benefit of that's one of the benefits of CF, CFRP uh, components, that high strength to weight ratio that enables increased performance in other areas. Fabricating these advanced aircraft does have challenges when it comes to machining the product. These have to be worked out well in advance uh, before your production article. That means looking at your processes closely and doing testing and, and validate that and to get it right the first time. And to consider practicing on a single piece fuselage, I threw out a $10 million tag, uh, would not be allowed or a good, a good idea. Uh, you blow the hole and now you're down a fuselage. Next slide, please. Here are two examples of the damage that you get from drilling into CFRP. Now you can see the top damage on that left side, and there may be some underneath at the exit. On the right side, hole and the cutout look uh, very good. And one way of alleviating that, you don't have to go blasting in there with a uh, a drill bit in circular interpolate. 
I would suspect that since they have to do that for the cutout pocket, they may have easily done that in a larger size hole next to it. Next slide. I think we have a video coming up here. Next one. But uh, these are the uh, uh, little details of uh, the rake angles and all of the items on the drill bit itself and how like on B you see it kind of grabs and pushes the fabrics up effect number one and then C there are two different illustrations as cutting force and so forth and you go to D on the second side when you're pushing that material you have the potential to break the fabric. So circular interpolation may be the key to doing some of this. I never did like that, but on this, on machining composites, it might be a good idea. And next slide, please. And here's our video. It looks like we're running a little bit late, so we'll have to skip the video and move um, to the next presenter. We are out of your close to being out of time. So we will uh, move to. OK, very um, good. We'll move to Brock. Thank you, Robin. Um, the suggestion that I'm going to make is that when we send the link to the video, that we go ahead and if we can set up links to the uh, the videos that you didn't get to play, um, that way we can supply them to the other people. The yeah, and, and they'll go on mute, but the reason why we're doing that are the three, uh, 50 to 51, 52. We got places to go and composites are gonna get us there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, our last presenter is going to be Brock Strong. Brock is currently the chief engineer at Epic Air Aircraft, um, working on the production of the E-1000 all-composite aircraft that was FAA certified in November of 2019. Since joining SME as a student member at Oregon Institute of Technology, uh, Brock, <clears throat> Brock has held multiple leadership roles on both the international and chapter levels, including co-chair of the Technical Community Network, chair and vice chair of member council, and the uh, as, and one of the advisors for the Composite Manufacturing Tech Group. In 2008, he was awarded SME's Outstanding Young Manufacturing Engineer Award. Brock has presented at multiple SME conferences in composite repair and manufacturing. He has also worked on numerous composite aircraft structures during his tenure in the aerospace community. He earned his bachelor's degree in manufacturing engineering and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the Oregon State, uh, Oregon Institute of Technology. Thank you for joining us, Brock. And please unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Thank you, Edie. I wanted to give an example and showcase a composite product that um, this is the Epic E1000. So a couple of stats on this airplane. It was FAA certified in November 2019. This airplane is 90% composites. At Epic, we manufacture almost every part of the airplane except for five major components and most of those are engine, avionics, uh, wheels and brakes. Uh, this is a six passenger airplane. It's made out of the same composite material that the Boeing 787 is, but we cure it at autoclave and at a 250 degree cure temperature. So one of the advantages of that is um, if you don't have the price of an autoclave and you can use a gas fired or electric fired oven. Uh, the cost of processing the composites is a lot cheaper. 
Um, we also fabricate this aircraft with um, prepreg and structurally bonded adhesives. Um, if you exclude the engine and um, access panels, this airplane has less than 200 fasteners on it, comparable to a metal airplane. Um, a metal airplane would have at least 10,000 fasteners just in the wings themselves. And so the advantage for us is we have a lot more, a lot less fastening and uh, we glue the airplane together. A um, couple other statistics on this airplane, it's an 8,000 pound airplane. Um, out of that 8,000 pounds, there's 1,100 pounds of just fuel that's carried on board. Another little over 1,000 pounds of passenger capability. So a good quarter of the weight of the airplane is stuff that it carries and passengers and fuel. So it's pretty economical in strength to weight ratios for composites. Um, this airplane has a 1200 horsepower engine. It flies 333 knots, which is 85 miles an hour and uh, best, um, uh, best cruise. Next slide. So I kind of wanted to showcase how this airplane is together. We talked about monocoque. This is a monocoque fuselage. So this fuselage doesn't have any ribs or stringers or frames in it. It's composite skins with a Nomex honeycomb core. And so it's glued together just like you would a typical plastic um, model airplane. So. Uh, what you're seeing here is bonding of the fuselage skins. We have a right skin and a, and a left skin. And this particular one, the left skin is getting bonded onto the right skin. And so you can see in the perimeter of the structure, we use our structural adhesive to glue everything together. And um, so this is what a monocoque fuselage looks like. Um, the advantage of this type of design is you're not taking up a lot of space with frames and stringers. There's a lot of uh, inexpensive tooling processes we use. Uh, we don't use any in-bar tooling or um, all of our tooling is composites. So we have a lot of composite tooling that we use for our molds and fixturing. And so we're using similar materials that we're making parts out of, so there's a lot of commonality there that helps reduce the price. This is a $3.85 million airplane. So, you know, if you can reduce your tooling costs and your process costs, that helps keep the airplane affordable. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the assembly of the airplane. Um, this airplane is all glued together, so our assembly area is fairly quiet. There's not the traditional metal airplane bucking of rivets or, or even a lot of drilling. Most of our holes are drilled by hand with hand drills and some of the same cutters that uh, Robin showcased. Um, but everything goes together like a, a model airplane with all the parts being glued together. Um, and then the last slide. So, uh, for our airplane, like I said, it was uh, certified in uh, 2016, or excuse me, 2019. Um, out of that, we've delivered 40 experimental built aircraft. So to be experimental, the owner of the airplane came in and built the airplane 51% of himself. And then since uh, November of 2019, we've delivered 16 airplanes we produce this airplane one a month. Uh, we're working towards one a week. And so as we um, work on efficiencies and uh, improving processes to reduce our, increase our production rate. So that's all I had for my presentation to help uh, showcase a final product for composites. Okay, thank you very much, um, Brock. There are, let's see, a couple of questions that were submitted. Um, Lou has answered them. They're in the Q&A chat. Um, question about curing times for the composite parts. 
and anywhere from minutes to days, depending upon the chemistry involved and if heat is applied. Um, and that will be usually the manufacturers of the particular resins uh, and the materials will have uh, kind of a, a recipe on how to, how to cure the composites. Um, let's see. What type of cutting fluid for machining carbon fiber composite? Uh, that would be, Robin, do you have a, uh, an answer for that, a reply? Uh, which one was that again? Uh, so the question is, what type of cutting fluid for machining carbon fiber composite? Uh, we don't use that, using that, it's cut dry. Okay, um, I do think that there was one person in the in, in the event chat that said that they did that it helped to um, reduce the the dust. Um, but again, it's going to be something where yeah, it depends. I, at least on aircraft, I know a lot of them have really strict instructions on how repairs are to be done in machining and things like that. Yeah, contamination is a big, big thing uh, in, in the oils and things like that. If we have a, if it ever resulted in a disc bond, it would be terrible. Yeah, correct. Um, so there, there was another question about certificates of attendance to be able to get um, continuing education. I put both in the Q&A and in the event chat to send an email to Susie. Uh, S. Marzano, M-A-R-A-Z-N-O, um, and Susie will be able to respond with a certificate for you that can be submitted. Uh, let's see, we are going to be sending a, um, a follow-up to this uh, that will include a, the slide deck because um, unfortunately, Robin wasn't able to go through a lot of his presentation. Um, we'll also have links to videos. And Susie? Absolutely. So um, sorry about running over. Thanks for everybody. Um, thanks to Edie, Lou, Brock, and um, Robin for the presentations. Um, we will have the archive available on the Composites Community webpage, along with the links to the videos, etc. Thanks, and thank you to all for joining us today. Thanks so much. Yes, Have and uh, one okay. one quick one here on the guests that uh, I gave some feedback on uh, the cutter things. I appreciate your feedback, and I will look into these. And if uh, you would like, we could communicate via email and uh, have some discussion on some of these things because. I'm always looking for uh, ways to improve and to understand uh, the process. Doesn't stop. Uh, yeah. Robin. And there, there was one additional question from Keith about differences in cutting thermal sets versus thermal plastic composites. I, I would uh, like to chime in on that just real quick. Um, certainly, there is a difference. Uh, normally, you can you can uh, with friction you can cause a lot of heat with either thermoplastics or thermo set resins. Um, I would be more wary of too much heat um, at high speeds with the thermoplastics. Um, depending on what the fiber reinforcements are, you may have to take a different uh, cutting speed and feed in order to accommodate it from your thermo set. So that would that would definitely be something to look into. And Thank just one much. more one more comment as we depart. Um, SME does have uh, the speakers came courtesy of the technical community for the co com composite manufacturing group. There are other technical groups available through SME, um, and I would encourage you to go to sme.org to find out about other technical groups. And if you're interested, please join the uh, Composite Manufacturing Group. And with that, um, I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. you very much for attending.